All right, in this video, I wanted us to take a big overview of aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration, and fermentation, and think about the benefits of each and how they sort of compare to one another. So let's uh, set a couple reminders about the critical details about the different forms of respiration and then fermentation. And the first thing I just want us to all agree on is that these processes serve one purpose, and that is for the cell to make ATP. So the only reason an organism does aerobic respiration is to make ATP. The only do reason they do anaerobic respiration is to make ATP. The only reason they perform fermentation is so that they can make ATP. And so if we keep that in mind, I think we can make a comparison of the processes and understand um, the benefits of one over the other. So everything else that is involved in those processes, so as you've learned about them, right, all the chemicals, they are simply substrates, waste products, or some sort of intermediate. And their purpose in the process is to allow the cell to make ATP. So let's just not lose track of ATP being the most important product of these processes. All right. So to discuss the different processes, I want to rely on these and uh, these images from a textbook. I think they do a particularly good job of setting up the comparison. So let's begin with aerobic respiration. So first, aerobic respiration involves several steps. We've learned the details of those steps, like glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain, or ETC. So in this image, we can see glycolysis at the top. Then we've got the Krebs cycle down here, got the electron transport chain. We know that aerobic respiration requires oxygen. Oxygen's role is that it is the terminal electron acceptor for the electron transport chain. So this image recognizes that right down here. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. Okay, So that's what makes this process aerobic. It uses oxygen gas as that terminal electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. Now, we just finished uh, highlighting the fact that the whole reason the cell is doing respiration is to make ATP. So the last reason I really like this figure is that it clearly lists at the bottom the theoretical maximum yield of ATP for aerobic respiration is 38 ATP molecules. So I should have mentioned before I moved on, um, aerobic respiration uses oxygen and aerobic respiration cannot use any other chemical other than oxygen for the terminal electron acceptor. And then again, the last detail we should recognize is that these steps produce a maximum of 38 ATP. We're going to compare the maximum possible yield between these three different processes um, as we go. All right, so that's aerobic respiration. These steps that we've learned about, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain, we know that oxygen has to be involved for this process to work, and it can make 38 ATP. So how about anaerobic respiration? So I've changed the image over here. Now it's representing anaerobic respiration. And in anaerobic respiration, we see that the steps are identical. It still involves glycolysis. It still involves the Krebs cycle. It still involves the electron transport chain. The only difference between aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration is that anaerobic respiration requires a non-oxygen terminal electron acceptor. So that's indicated here in the image. image. Some chemical other than oxygen is that terminal electron acceptor. And a few, option, or a few potential chemical electron acceptors are listed here, but there are many chemicals that cells could use. Again, this process cannot use oxygen. So even if oxygen was around, cells doing this process cannot utilize oxygen at that last step, just like 
aerobic respirators cannot utilize these chemicals in the last step. So this is the real differentiator between aerobic respiration. It involves all the same steps but uses oxygen. And then anaerobic respiration uses all the same steps but involves a chemical that is not oxygen. Again, the whole purpose of doing respiration is to make ATP. Anaerobic respiration makes somewhere between 2 and 36 ATP. The exact number that a cell can make, depend, make depends on the exact identity of the terminal electron acceptor that they use. So some chemicals are better electron acceptors than others. And the better the electron acceptor is, the more ATP you can make. So if you're using non-oxygen chemicals and you're doing anaerobic respiration, if you find the best possible non-oxygen electron acceptor, you'll make 36 ATP. All right, so that's anaerobic respiration. Let's move on to fermentation. So in fermentation, we're going to see that the steps are now different. So aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration used all the same set steps. They simply differ on what the electron acceptor is at the end. Fermentation does not use all the same steps. Fermentation does use glycolysis, so that step is in common to all three processes. But that's it. The next step in fermentation is this fermentation process. So we do glycolysis, we take out the pyruvate from glycolysis, and then we feed that pyruvate into fermentation. And we get these end products of either lactic acid or ethanol, depending on the organism. So again, this step does not require a terminal electron acceptor for the electron transport chain at all because fermentation does not utilize the electron transport chain at all. all right. The problem with fermentation is that this process only derives two ATP molecules. <clears throat> so we can see that that's by far the worst of the processes we've talked about so far. So we've gone over this simple comparison of aerobic respiration anaerobic respiration, and fermentation. And again, we really want to be focusing on the number of ATP that we can make if we do any one of these processes. So here they are side by side. Again, aerobic respiration uses glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain, specifically utilizing oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor, and we can make 38 ATP. Anaerobic respiration uses glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. But again, we're using some chemical other than oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor. We can only make up to 36 ATP because none of these terminal electron acceptors are as good at being an electron acceptor as oxygen. Oxygen is the best electron acceptor we have. That's why we can make 38 ATP if we use oxygen, but we can only make fewer ATP if we use a chemical that is not oxygen. Again, fermentation happens in the absence of oxygen. It doesn't use the Krebs cycle or the electron transport chain at all. Rather, we use this fermentation step, and we can only make 2 ATP. Again, the whole goal for an organism in doing any of these processes is to make ATP. Of course, the cell would want to make as many ATP as possible. So all things being equal, if the cell had a choice, we would always do aerobic respiration because it makes the most ATP. The problem is not all cells can do aerobic respiration. Some don't have this enzyme that can donate electrons to oxygen, and they can only donate electrons to some other chemical. So they do anaerobic respiration. Sometimes there's no oxygen available. The environment has become anaerobic, and those organisms may be forced into doing fermentation instead. 
So I just want you to walk away from this comparison with this understanding, right? The goal is to make ATP. Every cell wants to make as many ATP as they possibly can. That means aerobic respiration is the clear choice. Anaerobic respiration is not quite as good. And fermentation only makes two ATP. It's sort of the worst um, possible choice. But if the alternative is making no ATP at all and dying, hey, fermentation is pretty great. So let's end by thinking about how we categorize microbes based off of um, these, the ways they generate ATP. And so I just wanted to point out that there are several classes of microbes. So some microbes can only perform aerobic respiration. That means they have to have oxygen all the time to survive. And we call those organisms obligate aerobes. Obligate sort of means has to be or has to have. These have to be aerobic. They have to have oxygen in order to survive because the only way they can make ATP is to use oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor. All right. So there's another class of organisms that are called microaerophiles. They need oxygen as well. They just prefer to have less oxygen. And we can talk about why that is in another video. All right. So how about other microbes. Some microbes can perform aerobic respiration and, if needed, fermentation. They would only ever do one at a time based on if there was or was not oxygen present. We call these organisms facultative anaerobes. So that name means that they can grow anaerobic sometimes. Facultative is like, if need be, they can be anaerobic. And the way they're anaerobic is in fermentation. Fermentation lacks oxygen, it's anaerobic. So again, these organisms are not doing anaerobic respiration. They're either doing aerobic respiration and making 38 ATP, or they're doing fermentation and making 2 ATP. These organisms cannot do anaerobic respiration. All right, so the next group of organisms we can think about are microbes that can only perform anaerobic respiration. So we call these organisms obligate anaerobes. They have to be anaerobic all the time. Another category are organisms that we call aerotolerant anaerobes. So these two types of organisms, obligate anaerobes and aerotolerant anaerobes, are always performing anaerobic respiration. They're using a non-oxygen terminal electron acceptor, and they're making somewhere between 2 ATP and 36 ATP from each glucose molecule that they digest. Again, that's not as good as the 38 ATP you can generate from aerobic respiration. So I hope the understanding of sort of what microbes can do helps you figure out how we can classify them. I just want to end with this last piece of information, and that is that there are no microbes that can perform both aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. Microbes do one or the other. They might also be able to do fermentation, but they can never do both kinds of respiration. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about what microbes are doing when they live in their environment. So we'll end there. As always, if you have any questions, I hope you'll let me know, and I'll look forward to talking to you all again very soon.